Okay. Well, we're a couple minutes past the hour. So knowing that I know it's uh, at the later part of the day for everybody, I'm going to go ahead and get us started. Thank you all for joining us. Uh, today we are doing a webinar and conversation around fertility and infertility and really digging into facts versus fiction. And I realize that a lot of you may have seen some of the communications and great educational content, especially during National Infertility Awareness Week just a couple weeks ago, and you may have walked away with questions. And so today we have a great panel of experts that we're going to dig into some of the most common questions around fertility and hopefully answer some of your live questions as well. And so just to start in terms of our agenda, we'll be here with you for the hour, but we're going to start with some introductions. So we'll walk through our panelists background. You'll get to know each one of them a little bit more. We'll talk a little bit about the who's who of healthcare providers and maybe even unpack some of the acronyms you've heard out there in the provider community. We'll then talk about the stages of the journey, in particular, you know, what to think about when you're just curious versus starting to plan or even actively trying. And then we'll really kind of debunk some of those facts and uh, myths that you may have heard about fertility and infertility. And then finally, we'll close with some top takeaways from our experts where they'll talk about what they wish their patients knew as they were encountering them on the journey too. And then finally, like I mentioned, we'll definitely leave time for Q&A. You can submit questions via the chat feature or the Q&A feature. Uh, so thank you again for those of you that have already submitted questions as well. One quick disclaimer that we wanna start with is what we are sharing today does not contain medical advice, diagnosis, or treatment, and is not intended to be a substitute for professional or medical advice. And so what we're really hoping is that what today is, is a complement to the clinical care that you have and receive from your provider. All right, and again, I just reminded you, if you have questions, feel free to send them through. I'll also say if you have questions after the fact, we will be happy to answer them at hello at framefertility.com. Okay, well, let's start with our panelists. So I am going to definitely uh, read their fantastic bios because I know I will forget something if I don't actually read all the words. So I'm really excited today. We have four tremendous fertility experts that can span the spectrum of fertility and the patient journey. And we'll start with Dr. Chapel. Uh, Dr. Chapel is a Louisiana native. Uh, he holds a medical degree from the University of Texas Medical School at Houston and is double board certified in obstetrics and gynecology and reproductive endocrinology. Some of the terms that we will unpack a little bit later. Uh, he complimented, uh, he completed his internship and residency through the University of Alabama's program at the Women's and Infants Hospital and then went on to complete fellowship training in reproductive endocrinology and infertility at Baylor, Baylor College of Medicine. So Dr. Chapel, I'd love to just start with getting to know you and sharing your background a little bit more. I'm a little curious, how did you come to this career path? Well, I, I um, knew I wanted to be a doctor from an early age because I wanted to figure out how the body worked. And then I took a class in endocrinology in college where I saw, I read about the pituitary gland and how the brain talks to the ovary to prep the uterus to catch a baby. And I thought that was the most fascinating thing that I'd ever read. And I really just wanted to know everything about how that worked. Uh, and so then I spent the next several years of my life chasing down anyone who would tell me who does that for a living. Um, and then I finally found someone who gave a lecture on birth control pills and I followed her to her car and begged her to let me shadow her. And we've been friends ever since. And that, that kind of started my journey and 20 some odd years later, uh, here I am. Wonderful. That's amazing. Yeah. So you followed her to her car and she supported you. Didn't, didn't think it was creepy. <laughs> I, well, I was genuinely curious. <laughs> I love it. I love it. Fantastic. Well, great. Well, we're really excited to have you here today. Next, we're going to move to Dr. Ashley Eskew. Uh, Dr. Eskew is double board certified in obstetrics and gynecology and reproductive endocrinology and infertility. She specializes in infertility, egg freezing, polycystic ovarian syndrome, and recurrent pregnancy loss. She's in clinical practice in Charlotte, North Carolina, as the co-founder and chief medical officer at Obulife MD. So I'd love to have you share a little bit about Obulife MD, and thank you so much again for joining us today. Yeah, sure. I'm happy to be here. So, um, yeah. So, I, um, as Dr. Chapel, you know, I'm a practicing reproductive endocrinologist, and got into um, got really interested in fellowship in looking at different ways that modifiable lifestyle factors can impact fertility and reproductive outcomes, and. 
um, you know, as a part of fellowship, which I'll kind of talk about here in a minute, we have to do a research project. And one of the things that I became very interested in was specifically dietary patterns that are associated with reproductive outcomes. And in looking at the literature, they're just really wasn't a lot out there that put it in very tangible, actionable terms for patients. So co-founded OvulifeMD with my husband, who is actually a family practice physician, um, but super interested in just overall nutrition and wellness and how that impacts overall health um, and wellness in general. And so um, our goal with that, it's a digital education company that just kind of brings that evidence-based actionable information to women and couples who are actively trying to conceive. So, um, you know, focusing on things that can actually make a difference for themselves as well. Fantastic. And you're in business with your partner. Uh, I can yes. definitely sympathize there. How exciting. <laughs> yes. Exciting, challenging, <laughs> all the things. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, exactly. But mostly exciting. Yes. <laughs> so, yes. Yeah. Wonderful. Sorry. And I keep hitting the, uh, the mute button for some strange reason. So uh, now we're on to Dr. Mary M. M. Bay. She is a, a Yale graduate and practicing OBGYN physician and surgeon in New York City with experiencing managing conditions across all ages, such as PCOS, endometriosis, fibroids, adenomyosis, infertility, vaginitis, and menopause. Additionally, she has several years of experience creating medical content and currently serves as a medical advisor, medical writer, and editor for several startups focused on women's health. She also has a bunch of words in her bio that I always seem to trip up on when I'm trying to read quickly. So uh, I appreciate the patience there. Um, so uh, Dr. Mbe, you advise some other startups in this space. So I'm really curious, uh, what role do you think companies like this play in supporting patients and patient care? Yeah, so I initially got interested in working with startups just because we're limited in kind of what we can do with patients within the time that we have per visit. Um, and so a lot of these startups, especially now with COVID and a lot of people making use of telehealth kind of try to bridge the gaps that are that exist in care, um, which I think is very important, makes it much more accessible for patients regardless of where they are financially, physically, geographically, all of that. Um, and I definitely think since telehealth in general is here to stay, um, the big challenge now is just trying to make sure that that access is equitable, holistic for everybody and kind of provides the care that they need. So I think it's important to have medical people within that as these startups get bigger and um, catch traction to make sure that the team's on track. We're still focusing on health outcomes for the people that are using these apps in the future. Fantastic. Couldn't agree more. Wonderful. Um, so now on to Dr. Stevenson. Uh, so Dr. Eleanor Stevenson is a clinical professor at, of nursing at Duke University School of Nursing, where she teaches in the DMP, MSN, and ABSN programs. She received her PhD in nursing research and theory development from NYU College of Nursing, and her research and other professional activities are focused on the topics of female and male infertility and family planning. Uh, Dr. Stevenson, I'd love to have you cover off on some of the research areas that you're particularly excited about right now. Yeah, so thank you for having me today. Um, so some of the stuff that I am particularly interested in that I, that I do work in is looking at how, um, what the experience of, of men uh, in what I call female facing healthcare structures um, is and how we can be more inclusive of men during the process. And what I mean by female facing healthcare structures are um, obstetrics, uh, family planning and fertility care. Um, because those care systems typically, they do, typically face the, the female because that's the, the individual who receives the, the physical, the bulk of the physical care. Um, I want to understand how we can make the care experience uh, inclusive to make sure that, that uh, we're caring for the whole couple or the whole family um, in the process and particularly in the fertility setting, um, ensuring that the male partner is receiving the care um, uh, that, that they deserve as well along the process. So that's what I've been working on. Fantastic. And I know we'll talk about this a little bit later, but um, maybe just while we're on the topic, you know, one of the things that I was stunned about when I went through this journey was how much of infertility can be rooted in male factors. So I'm curious, can you just quickly speak to some of the data on that point? Yeah, so absolutely. Um, so I think the, the big perception is that uh, fertility and infertility is really a female issue and that the, the majority of, of infertility diagnoses really rest with the female and that the data just isn't, that doesn't support it. Um, we know that about 40% of infertility has a female factor and about 40% has a male factor. And then there's another 20% that we, we can't find a, a reason for. But the, the big takeaway is that it's equally shared 
Um, it's just, it could uh, likely be as much a, a male issue as it could be a female issue. Yeah, no, thanks for sharing. Again, that was one of the things that really surprised me. Well, wonderful. Again, very honored to have this group all together. Uh, I also have the honor of working with a lot of them as part of our clinical advisory board here at Frame Fertility. So honored to have this group of tremendous experts on the topic here today. So now we're going to talk about a couple of different topics. Um, oh, actually, we're going to do some polling questions. I apologize. I forgot that we have some great polling questions. So I'd love to start actually with learning a little bit more about this group, which can color the direction we go. Uh, we'll start with understanding where you are in your journey. We'd love to learn more about what sources you rely on for your knowledge and information about uh, fertility. And then where are you at today in terms of confidence level in understanding your fertility? So I'm going to put out a poll. And hopefully everybody can see it. The panelists cannot answer. So um, you should not see it on your end, but everybody else who's on the phone should be able to answer. All right. Oh, exciting. I feel like I'm cheating because I can see all the answers before anybody else can, so. All right, we'll give everybody a couple more minutes. Well, a couple more seconds to be fair. All right. Okay. Last chance to get your information in. And then I will pull up the results on the screen. So um, really interesting to see this, um, although it mirrors a lot of what we have seen at Frame Fertility. So it looks, at, looks like about a third of you, um, it's not even on your radar today. So kudos for coming and wanting to learn more. A third are just curious and a third are starting to plan. And it looks like we have some other in here too, which I know we may have some employers um, and healthcare providers on the line too. Um, sources of information. Um, so 83% uh, rely on, on doctors, which is aligned with what I've seen in the data. 67% from friends and family. I think social media is always one that's climbing up there. I'm curious what platforms people are, are relying on these days. And then how confident are you? So looks like 50% are somewhat not confident. Uh, so again, glad that you're on the line today and hopefully you leave feeling more confident after today's discussion. Really great to see these numbers. Thank you so much for, for submitting them. We'll keep them in mind as we go forward in the presentation. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about the who's who. I'm gonna turn it over to Dr. Eskew. I thought this would be a great place for us to start because a lot of times at Frame, we have people asking, well, who do I go to for you know talking about my periods? Or I've heard this term RE or REI, what does that really mean? So thought we could at least start with some of the names, some of the acronyms, and just give you a lay of the land of, of who you might encounter on your fertility journey. So I'm gonna let Dr. Eskew walk through this. Yeah, so I think that this is definitely an important topic to cover. So I'm glad that we um, added it to this. So, you know, kind of starting with um, who you see on a you know typical annual basis really tends to fall into one of two categories. And this is for, for men, could be either your primary care provider, that could be someone who's family medicine trained, it could be a mid-level provider like an MP or a PA, a nurse practitioner, a physician assistant, it could be an internal medicine provider or an IM doctor. So lots of like alphabet soup there with um, the different kind of credentials, but they kind of do screening for overall health and wellness um, in general for both men and women. Now, some primary care providers will also do more of the preventative female care, if you will. So your routine pap smears, they'll order your mammogram for you, um, that sort of thing. And I think that that's a great place to get started to get overall general care and wellness, especially if it's not necessarily on your radar yet in terms of family building, but you know, just wanna keep up with your preventative care. And then you have obstetrician and gynecologist, so, um, or an OBGYN who also functions as a primary care provider for a lot of women, because a lot of times this is the only physician that women will see um, and get care from. So they can do a lot of preventative care, um, you know, same thing, the pap smears, that sort of stuff. They also do more surgeries. So if you have issues with fibroids, which are really common, endometrial polyps, um, you know, one of the things that was on Dr. Mumbai's um, 
uh, bio was, you know, adenomyosis and that sort of thing, they will also often start the workup for infertility as well. So if you're well established with an OBGYN provider and you say, Hey, you know, I've been, I'm either starting to think about trying to conceive. It is good to tell them that they're going to order specific labs, um, preconception testing. Um, they'll do some extra education on, you know, lifestyle factors, make sure you're on a good prenatal vitamin, um, offer carrier screening, um, you know, more of the, the preconception type counseling that's really important prior to pregnancy. So telling them that number one, you're, you're thinking about trying in the near future. And also when you get to the point when you've been trying for some time, and that could be, you know, six months for women above the age of 35 or 12 months, if you're less than 35, that would be, you know, consistent with infertility. Um, and oftentimes they will start that work up by getting baseline evaluation for both the female partner and the male partner, um, and depending on the cause can often initiate treatment. So um, it's not uncommon to have an OBGYN do medications to help a woman ovulate if she has issues with ovulatory dysfunction, which is often the case with women with polycystic ovary syndrome, for example, which impacts one in 10 women. Um, you know, some provide some OBGYN providers will also do, um, you know, kind of the initial treatments for fertility treatment for mild male factor, um, including intrauterine inseminations and that sort of thing. But, but beyond that, that's whenever you kind of step into the scope of the RE or the REI. And, and that's the REI stands for reproductive endocrinologist and infertility specialist. And I think it's also important to kind of go over the differences in, in training and providers as well, which we'll kind of talk about with maternal fetal medicine, MFM, urology as well. So for OBGYNs, general OBGYNs, they do four years of medical school and four years of residency. Um, and they do, you know, as an OBGYN resident, we train in all sorts of area, labor and delivery, um, GYN oncology, um, urogynecology, uh, reproductive endocrinology. So a lot of different areas. And then ultimately you have OBGYNs that sometimes just do GYN. Um, so just gynecologic care and some that just deliver babies or just obstetric care. Um, but it's four years of residency and passing two sets of boards. And then if you decide to subspecialize, then it's another three years, specifically in the case for reproductive endocrinologists and infertility specialists. And I mentioned when I was um, speaking initially that you have to do a research project as a part of that. So it's a pretty intensive three years um, that's divided up into 18 months of clinical work and then 18 months of research. So really diving deep into the reproductive hormones and um, different treatment options available. Um, more advanced reproductive technologies like IVF or in vitro fertilization um, and that sort of thing. And I think that's important to note because it's yet another set of boards, both written and oral, um, that, that kind of gives you that double board certification. And so being mindful also when you're looking for a provider and looking for a, you know, quote unquote, fertility specialist, what is their training? What are their credentials? Where did they do fellowship? Where did they do OBGYN training? Are they fellowship trained? Um, these are important questions to ask and to get the answers to. And you have to kind of look at it with a discerning eye. Um, which is really unfortunate, I feel like, um, in general, for people to not be able to tell exactly what level of training their, their specialist has. But um, for a truly double board certified reproductive endocrinologists and infertility specialists, um, it's, it's publicly available information. You can look that up on the American Board of OBGYNs um, or abog.org. Um, and then you have other specialists, right? So beyond um, reproductive endocrinologists, so when I see a couple, you know, I'm assessing both the, the male and female partners um, and, and helping each of them. And, and if there is a male factor, which as we mentioned is um, a very common diagnosis, oftentimes that requires a referral to a urologist um, who specializes in male factor infertility. So again, that's additional specialized training um, specifically in the treatment of male factor infertility. And depending on what the etiology is, um, that can involve additional laboratory evaluation, sometimes surgical intervention um, as well. And then you have maternal fetal medicine specialists, which often are confused with REIs, <laughs> ironically, but they are um, also known, I've heard them called neonatologists and perinatologists. Um, they are the high risk obstetric doctors. So oftentimes women of advanced maternal age are considered high risk. So a lot of our patients will follow with maternal fetal medicine as well, but they also do a four-year OBGYN residency and then go on and do an additional three years specifically in maternal fetal medicine. Um, so they'll often do your advanced ultrasounds, follow you throughout pregnancy. 
and that sort of thing. And so I think it's important to understand those different buckets of providers and, you know, where, where you are in your journey will, will be, you know, yes. reflective of who you're seeing in that regard. Um, and it's also important to know, you know, who is not these people, right? Um, so, you know, thinking about other types of, of specialists, I would say, beware of, you know, people who claim to be fertility experts or, um, you know, fertility expert coach or a hormone expert. Um, you truly, you know, I've seen two week training courses to become a fertility hormone expert. You cannot do that in two weeks. You cannot have an in-depth understanding of, of the, um, intricate, you know, reproductive endocrine system, um, in two weeks. I wish you could, because that would have saved me three years of training, but <laughs> unfortunately that's not the case. And so again, just being, you know, aware of the different types of providers out there being, aware of who you follow on social media, where you're getting your information from, what are their credentials, um, and knowing that, you know, in terms of medical doctors, you have MDs, which are medical doctors, allopathic trained, or DOs, which are doctors of osteopathy um, and osteopathic trained. Both of those are, you know, you know, medical treatment doctors that could do additional treatments such as this as opposed to, to some of the other ones that you might see out there. So um, I know that's a lot of information, but I hope that kind of helps break those great. up and, and give a little more, um, shed a little more light on each of those too. That's great. No, thank you for digging in on that. And, and it was a great call out around training, you know, for the, for the average person, again, I know when I was going through this, uh, it was overwhelming to think about, you know, which type of providers to see, who to go to, et cetera. And a lot of times it is, you know, references from friends. Are there any um, uh, kind of key elements of someone's background to look for? So you mentioned kind of where they go to school, where they got training, but I imagine the average person doesn't know what's a good institution or not. So is it looking for fellowship uh, uh, experience? What, what things would you call out, especially as you're looking at specialists in particular? Yeah, you know, um, everybody who because I think there is a generation of reproductive endocrinologists and infertility specialists who were grandfathered in, so to speak, but that was like before 1970. So I'd say most of them are probably not in practice anymore or are likely on the way out. But I think looking for both, you know, they did OBGYN residency and fellowship train and not necessarily where they did fellowship, but you also can see, you know, there's kind of two types of board certification statuses. So you have board eligible where someone has completed their initial training and they have not sat for their completed oral boards. And then you have board certified and that's what you can see on ABOG. And it is not uncommon for people who are, you know, like me last year, I'm two and a half years out of fellowship. I'm board eligible because I hadn't had the opportunity to sit for my oral boards yet, but just seeing that they have those credentials is really the most important thing. And you can ask them, right? I always encourage patients if they're a little weary and they're yes. like, oh, I can't tell, like, where did they go? You know, ask them and say, okay, well, if you, and if they're doing fertility treatment, well, then where did you do fellowship too? Um, because more and more you see a lot of um, different types of providers in fertility clinics. And it's really hard. Like you think you're going to a fertility clinic, right? You should be seeing a, a REI and, and that's not always the case. So um, I hope, that helps answer that question a little bit too. Absolutely. And I think most importantly to your comment, if you're not sure, ask. So I think that's mm -hmm. a, a great clarification. Yeah. Wonderful. Well, thank you for that overview. Yeah. So now we're going to talk a little bit about the stages of the journey. And I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Chapel to talk a little bit about how to think about the different stages and what to focus on. I know there's a lot on this slide too, but I know he's going to talk through how to think about the different stages of the journey. I do love to talk and I, and I really like this slide. I, I feel like being in the fertility you know, area in the field, I see a lot of patients and, and I feel like one of the most overwhelming, the overwhelmingly the most common thing I hear after a consult is why didn't I come talk sooner? I, I can't believe we waited one year, two years, three years, seven years before having this conversation. So I really like how front thinking frame is and, and saying, you know, we need to get this information out there sooner than later. So people are thinking about this on the front end, like they make any other decision of, of, of it that uh, has a major impact in their life. Um, we should think about fertility like we think about all major decisions. And so I think talking about the stage of the journey makes a whole lot of sense um, because I find many people, many patients are asking questions too late. So if we're in that kind of prep phase of, you know, I, I don't really know. I, I, I think I'm just kind of getting started uh, with my adult life. And I, I, I think I might want a family. I think I'm, I might not want a family, I, you know, who knows? 
then this is a time where you could be thinking about what pregnancy may mean for you. Where are you with your goals? What Are you a kind of person that always saw yourself with a big family or a small family? Do you have other medical conditions that you need to think about? How would they affect your pregnancy and how would they affect, um, you know, is this pregnancy going to be a high risk or not? Some people know they have multiple sclerosis or rheumatoid arthritis or migraines or fill in the blank. That's going to have an impact in how you experience pregnancy. You need to be thinking about that and, ask, and asking questions to your providers about that. This is the time to just initiate a conversation with your OBGYN or your primary care physician and say, hey, you know, I'm, I'm still at this phase of my journey. I'm not, I'm not trying to get pregnant yet. That's maybe a few years down the road, but I know that you're treating me for X, Y, and Z. What does pregnancy look like with that? How does building a family matter in this regard? Are the medications that I'm on pregnancy safe? Or are we going to have to change those up? Those are really good questions to ask early on. Good places to go for tips would be ACOG, A-C-O-G, the American College of OBGYN, or ASRM, the American Society of Reproductive Medicine, has an awesome website called reproductivefacts.org. <clears throat> Excuse me, fantastic website just to go do a little shallow dive. And those are good safe places that are probably a little bit more, uh, they're, they're more reputable, they're more, they're more vetted than, uh, than TikTok or the gram. So I think that's, those would be the places that I would, I would start. As you just think about what might pregnancy look like for me and how many times do I wanna be pregnant? And then as you kind of get your head around those, we're starting to think about your plan, starting to think about timeline. Don't forget that it's not just pregnant baby, pregnant baby, pregnant baby. It takes nine months to make a baby and then it takes six to 24 months to kind of reset your body to get ready to make another one. So if you want 18 kids and you wanna wait till you're 35, those two things do not go together. You kind of have to build in your plan to a realistic timeline. Um, and then at the same time, again here, and I think this is where Dr. Eskew's points really came into play, think about your health. Um, this is where you have the opportunity to kind of optimize your chances by making your body as ready to be pregnant as possible. And I think that to Dr. Eskew's point, we don't do a great job of thinking about health as it relates to fertility. Fertility is kind of one of the vital signs. If your blood pressure is good and your pulse is good and you're not running a fever and you're having regular cycles and you're fertile, all those things point to the fact that your body's in line and in good homeostasis. So be thinking about your nutrition and your diet, be thinking about your exercise, sleep, stress, any vices like smoking, drinking, all those kind of things. How do they impact your fertility? Another good conversation, another good opportunity to engage in your primary care physician and say, hey, I like to have a glass of wine once or twice a week. Is that going to be a problem if I'm ready to start having a kid in the next, in the next few months? Or, you know, I, I really having some trouble sleeping. I think I'm snoring. Do I need to be screened for apnea or things like that? Or, hey, doc, you know, I, I, I'd like to lose 15 pounds. What's the best diet for me in, in my story with my metabolism? And you can kind of use this prep time of I'm about to jump into this trying phase to optimize your general health. And that's just gonna help your body work better. When your body's working good, your body is giving, your brain is seeing that and saying, okay, let's send down some signals, let's grow an egg, let's release an egg, or hey, let's send some messages down to the testicle to make some good sperm. And so body functioning well, fertility is one of the first things that, that rises up. When the body's not functioning well, fertility is the first thing to go. So that I would be proactive about thinking about those things. And now as we kind of enter the actively trying phase, this is, um, you know, some people are like, track, 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 ovulation predictor kits, basal body temperature, chart everything, crate and model, da, da, da. And, and, and then they always say, but don't be stressed. And I, don't, I, don't, I just think that those two things are completely um, uh, incongruous. And so uh, I think you need to find a healthy balance. There are about 300 uh, ovulation apps out there. Uh, I loved when I first started uh, this in, 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 in fertility, there was only two. It was Glow and it was Flow. And it was great. I knew how to use them both. And so I just hand over your phone, but now there's, there's, there's 300 and I have to learn a different interface with every patient, but, uh, but use an app. If you like using an app, if you like using an old composition notebook with, with some, you know, an inspirational message on the front of it, use that too. But, but tracking your cycle in one form or fashion is a good idea. If you like doing basal body temperatures, that's okay. That's my pet peeve, but it's okay to do that one. If you like using ovulation predictor kits, that's expensive, but okay. If you wanna just record the first day of each, of each of your menstrual periods, that's enough. That's enough information over the course of six to 12 months to have a really good idea as to how your brain and your ovaries are talking and it's free. So just tracking cycles in some minor way, maybe, maybe considering a symptom journal if you have 
pelvic pain, or if you have heavier bleeding, or if you just have something that you sense that you feel that may be off, writing those things down as you track those cycles, that one sheet of paper at, the, at, a, at, a, at, a, at a medical visit tells us almost everything we need to know. It is valuable. It doesn't need to be every temperature you've ever taken. It doesn't need to be every LH surge, and it doesn't need to be a picture of every OPK. We certainly get those. We get the binder and, and, and we go through those and that's information, but it's also maybe a little bit too much information because you can be so stressed out. So find the balance, track what you can track and just, and just kind of be consistent with that. And again, continuing to think about your health in general. Actively trying, Dr. Eskew also touched on this, it's six to 12 months and before you need to be asking questions, but that's if everything is going perfect. So let's move into like, when, when should you say, okay, enough is enough, I need, I need help. Um, again, this whole process, you're engaging your primary care physician or your OBGYN. You're talking to them about getting ready to try. You're talking to them about getting, getting amped up and, and how to try. And then you're actively trying. But at some point, you got it's not working. You got to go talk to, a, to a, a more specific specialist like a reproductive endocrinologist. It's six to 12 months. If you're over 35, don't wait longer than six months. If you're under 35, you can give it that full 12 months. But that's if everything is going good. If you're having a cycle every month and you're feeling good and you're tracking and everything makes sense. If you're not having regular cycles, something's off of libido, you're having very heavy cycles or shorter cycles or, or, or you're, you're sensing that, that things aren't exactly working. Don't wait a year. You don't, your check engine light is on. Go in sooner and have those conversations sooner so that we can see, is there a problem? My favorite thing to do is to have a conversation with someone and say, oh, well, actually you're probably ovulating around this day. So, so go away, you know, and, and go try on your own for three months doing it this way. That's a perfectly reasonable, okay conversation. They don't necessarily need treatment. They just needed to push in the right direction. That's an okay thing to say, but it's, but it's, it's less okay for someone to come in after a year of trying doing it completely wrong and haven't wasted that precious year because, because time is over. Um, red flags, the, the things that if I saw these, I would say probably have that conversation now-ish. Let's see. So like, again, if you have just no signs or symptoms of ovulation, if, this, if your cycles are very irregular, you know, I have some patients that, that, you know, they haven't had a period since the last president, and yet they wait a year before having a conversation like, hey, that you're not going to get pregnant if you're not ovulating. Let's talk about why you're not having cycles. Shorter cycles are one of the things that worries me the most. Shorter cycles can be a sign of egg reserve going down faster than it should. Because if you're ovulating quickly, then you're having shorter cycles, more like you know, every three weeks as opposed to that every four weeks that you read about in, in the books. So if you're having cycles every three weeks, that can be a sign of irregular ovulation or unstable lining. And that can be a sign of a lower egg reserve. And that conversation needs to be had sooner than later. Um, persistent pelvic pain, that's, that can be a sign of a number of things. It's very nonspecific, but it's worth a conversation. And pelvic pain is very annoying and very debilitating. You deserve a conversation sooner than later. Um, and then the final thing I'd say is that you're, you are your best advocate so if you're frustrated with not getting the answers you want, either on social media or from the person that you're seeing or from your friends or from your family who say, don't worry about it, don't stress, just keep trying. If you're frustrated and you want more answers, you want more guidance, that's a totally reasonable time to have a conversation. To Dr. Embe's point, it's easier than ever to get on a Zoom call with four specialists you know, and me um, to, to have you know, a quick little overview of what's going on and what you can do better. So don't hesitate. Uh, it's just it's just too easy these days. Um, and then, yeah. And again, keep in mind that a, you, a ba it, it's not realistic to have ten babies in two years. This is this is an ongoing process, and it's not. You know, everybody says, "Oh, I got pregnant that first month." That's not always the whole story. It it can it takes it doesn't doesn't happen overnight. But it but it can happen according to your plan as long as you take a few minutes to to make that plan. Yeah, I it's think a, I'll stop. that's a great clarifying point. Um, that was something that I didn't even think about. Even the nine months to create a baby wasn't something that fully occurred to me either. So I think it is something that often gets lost. Um, Dr. Chapel, I'd be curious for those people that are um, exploring, uh, going to treatment uh, immediately, those that are in a same sex relationship, want to explore reciprocal IBF or surrogacy, et cetera. What advice would you provide on that front? Like how, how soon is too soon to have those conversations or what does that process look like too? Yeah. Uh, so that process, I mean, so if you, if you're either a single mother by choice or same sex, or you were born without a uterus and you know, you need a gestational carrier, or you have some contraindication to pregnancy and maternal fetal medicine has said, 
you can't get pregnant, you need to probably consider a gestational carrier or a surrogate. Quick sidebar, a gestational carrier uses your eggs and your partner's sperm to carry the pregnancy. A surrogate uses their own eggs and your partner's sperm to carry the pregnancy. That's just a little sidebar. Um, yeah, you know, those, those conversations need to happen immediately. Just like someone that hasn't had a cycle in months or years, clearly there's an issue that needs to be addressed. Clearly there's an issue that needs to be addressed here. This person needs um, extended or, 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 or elevated care. That conversation needs to happen. Um, no one has high blood pressure and then waits a year. If they know they have high blood pressure, they come in for medical care. If you know you need a gestational carrier or you know you need sperm donor or egg donor or some sort of uterine help in, in the form of gestational care or surrogacy, have that conversation. Um, and I do think to, if you know you need it, but you know you don't want it for another two or three years, like, so let's say, you know, 23 year old uh, woman who's married to her wife and they know they want kids when they're 27 or 28 or 29 or something like that because they want to finish graduate school together. I still think it's reasonable to have that conversation at 23 because what you, what you want to know is what can I be doing to prepare for this? For, for someone that comes in at 23 or 24, maybe they have endometriosis and they, and they have a lower egg reserve and they, they might want to consider going through their procedures now to freeze eggs or embryos now so that they can actually have a good shot at 27 when they're actually ready to carry, for example. So I think when you know that you need that help, have that conversation. You don't have to wait until the day that you want to be pregnant. That, okay. that is, that's a common mistake. It's a great clarification. Well, wonderful. Well, I'm going to keep us moving. Um, this was a, a terrific overview. Um, but I want to switch gears to talking about some of the most common questions that we get at Frame, because I'd love to have Dr. Mbe and Dr. Stevenson talk through, again, some of the questions or, or maybe myths that you've heard out there that we want to unpack today. So Dr. Mbe, I want to start with you. Um, would you talk through some of these questions and kind of the, the facts underneath the surface? Forgot to unmute. Um, so for to, for to start on the top left there, it does say, what role does age play? Um, does that only affect women? Um, and we know age does affect both partners. Um, so with uh, patients who have eggs, we typically will see that egg counts tend to accelerate in terms of how quickly they go down after age 35. But something that a lot of patients don't know until we tell them is the fact that your eggs, as soon as you start having periods, are starting to go down. And so we know that that is a constant process. We just know that at age 35, that just tends to happen a little bit faster. So that's why there's that change in waiting um, 12 months um, versus six months once we get to 35. With um, patients with sperm, we typically do see that quality starts to go down around age 40. Um, I know it seems unfair because for women, um, advanced medical ages or advanced uh, maternal ages at age 35 for men, it's closer to in their 50s. Um, but it is something to kind of consider, even though it's not something that's talked about as often. Um, another thing that comes up a lot is whether or not family history matters. So if your parents didn't have any issues or if they did have issues, are you going to have the same kind of story? And we do know that that tends to be a good indication of whether or not you may have issues um, down the line. A lot of times if parents or siblings or other family members have issues getting or staying pregnant, that may be something that you might have to deal with as well. So it would be a reason to go see either your OBGYN or see a specialist, um, an REI specialist. Um, another one that we see all the time is birth control. That's probably the most common thing I see as an OBGYN. That's a question I get probably every day. A lot of patients are on birth control for a very long time. If you started your birth control in high school for really painful periods or heavy periods, you might be on that for 10, 15, 20 years before you decide you want to get pregnant. Birth control in and of itself does not affect fertility, but we do know that it's very important, A, to know what your periods were like off birth control, which sometimes people don't know, again, because if you've been on birth control since you were a teenager, you're not gonna remember that. But I always will tell people, we want to see what your periods are off that birth control, because if you don't have periods off birth control, um, to Dr. Chappelle's point, that's something we want to talk about as soon as we find that out, rather than waiting a year later and you're like, oh, I, I never had a period. Um, so definitely something that we want to kind of suss out for patients. And then also considering the fact that it does take a little bit of time with certain birth controls for your period to return. So that's always something to kind of talk about with your doctor as well. 
Thank you so much. And I'm curious, um, what's the like average length of time somebody should wait until they raise their hand and say, I think there may be an issue here for coming off birth control? So for, for me personally, I like to give people three months because I feel like that's enough time for most things to have re-regulated back to normal. If you've come off birth control and it's been three months and you haven't had a period, please come in <laughs> or do a telehealth visit or something. Wonderful. That's very clarifying. Yeah. Great. All right. Uh, Dr. Stevenson, will you cover a couple of the other ones? Sure. So um, we talked a little bit about the, the top uh, one about the female issue at the start of this this conversation. I just want to expand on that just a little bit and just you know talk about why um, I think there is such a, a misperception. And I think it, it's it's in part because of stigma that's associated with infertility. And a lot of people don't like to talk about their experience with infertility. And um, it's actually a little more common than I think a lot of people understand um, is that it can be upwards of 15% of couples experiencing infertility. Um, and, and, you know, like I said, people don't generally talk about it. And I would say that that's a little more common for men than it is for, for, for women um, if they're experiencing uh, infertility. And while it can be upwards of 15% of couples, there's good news um, because the majority of, of um, um, issues that are identified, there are treatable options. And so to the bottom left one, you know, is IVF the only option? And the answer is no, there's lots of treatment options and it's very, gonna be very specific and related to what the underlying issue is for the, the woman, the couple, um, whomever is trying to seek the, the pregnancy. And so it could be something that requires a very um, high level medical treatment, or it could be something that, that is a lot less complicated. Could also be lifestyle, addressing some of these lifestyle factors. I know Dr. Chappell talked about that um, um, earlier as well, uh, but I think the, that a lot of people don't understand that lifestyle really does have an influence on fertility and making those lifestyle modifications, addressing things like diet and smoking and alcohol, marijuana use, um, and also just stress, sleep, those sorts of things really can um, and are very, very important in, in the uh, fertility process. Wonderful. No, thank you for the clarification on lifestyle factors. And I'm curious, um, when we talk to a lot of people that come to us and they're concerned about long-term implications of lifestyle. So can you talk a little bit about how to think about you know, even the stress of, I, I wasn't well behaved 10 years ago. How does that might impact my fertility going forward? How should they think about that? You know, so lifestyle is something I think we all try to strive to improve in, <laughs> in all of our own worlds. Um, and, you know, by starting early and thinking about fertility, uh, thinking about lifestyle and how it impacts fertility can actually really help in the long run. So it's not just in the ability to get pregnant, it's the ability to have a healthy pregnancy and it's the ability to be healthy into parenthood in whatever shape that takes, whether it's through a biological pregnancy or, or, some, or uh, um, how our family building happens. Um, and so lifestyle is important for, for the long term. Um, as far as previous lifestyle, if, if you know, people misbehave, so to speak, in college and whatnot, you know, we, we are pretty adaptable creatures. And uh, there are ways that we can, we can improve these things through, like I said, weight loss, reducing some of those risks, um, reducing some of the the, the uh, habits that we know are can have some some bad uh, long term impacts. That's great. Thanks for clarifying. Well, we had um, a couple of questions come through that I was seeing. Um, one of these actually goes back to the the prior slide. So um, either Dr. Stevenson or Dr. Chapel, you can address this. We talked a little bit about um, female red flags. What are the what are the male red flags that we should be looking for? <laughs> So with, with male flags, sometimes they can be pretty subtle. Um, and sometimes very often when there is a male factor uh, um, um, diagnosed, we don't often know until there is a problem in family building. Perhaps, you know, through regular intercourse, it's well-timed, doesn't seem like there's anything wrong with the female cycles. Um, and sometimes it's at that point that a uh, semen analysis is done. And that's when, when a problem is, is detected. Um, there are things that can precede that. So if there is a libido issue and an inability to, to have intercourse, um, certainly those things are, are something that, that can be brought a little bit earlier in the process. Very often we, um, we see those issues at the time of diagnosis. Yeah, I would just, I would echo what Dr. Stevenson said. Honestly, the, 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 the two things here are, are abnormalities in the semen analysis are extremely common. 
and semen analyses are pretty darn cheap to get. So I, I, I don't, I, I am a strong advocate for saying the first step in a fertility workup has nothing to do with the female. It's get the guy to do the semen analysis because you're, you're going to find a problem almost half the time. And that's usually the first step in recognizing there is a problem. So the, there are three things that I tend to look for for guys to, to see if there are red flags there. Number one, do they have any medical conditions already? So folks that have diabetes or other inflammatory conditions, or they have a history of trauma or surgery to the pelvis, what's in their medical history there? Those things are the bigs. A history of undescended testicle, most guys don't know that, but they'll say, you know, my mom told me that I needed to have a surgery when I was two days old. That's a bit of a red flag too, because that means an undescended testicle and that can be a problem. So um, history of surgery, trauma to the pelvis, or medical conditions that they're being treated for, some of those can cause issues with fertility. Number two, testosterone. So that's the other big one, is you say, is your husband on any testosterone or steroids or bodybuilding uh, supplements? Not all bodybuilding supplements like protein powder or creatine or anything like that are necessarily inherently bad, although soy protein can be bad for males, um, not, not, necess not necessarily females, but that, that's something maybe Dr. Eskew may want to speak to. Uh, with her background. Uh, but, but testosterone is a, is a major, major effective contraception for men. And, and most of the guys that are on it, and I see a couple a week, have no idea. So, so prior medical issues or surgery to the pelvis, testosterone. And then the third thing that I say is just get the semen analysis because the other things that are undiagnosed, we're going to diagnose through the sperm. That is, that is such an important, because guys don't see doctors. I haven't seen a doctor since I was like 12, you know, and I am a doctor. Uh, so, you know, guys need to go see a doctor, but they don't know they need to go see a doctor until their wife forces them to have a semen analysis that shows there's a problem. Those are great points. Start, start with the male. I love it. Um, I have not heard this yet. So this is, this is great. Um, well, wonderful. There was one other question that came through and th this is around, uh, basically, am I good if I'm getting my period? So, you know, I think there could be some misconceptions around, well, I'm getting a regular period, I must be ovulating, right? How should we think about that? Um, Dr. Mbeya, I know you talked a little bit about this, but I'd be curious if anybody else has thoughts here too. Yeah, I'd say a couple of things. I mean, getting having a regular cycle, like Dr. Chapel said, is kind of like another vital sign for me, but um, but that's not the only piece, right? Um, a common question that I get is if I have a regular cycle, does that mean my fallopian tubes are open? And that's where the sperm meets the egg. And that has no indication on whether or not you have open fallopian tubes or not. Um, you know, are your cycles painful? Are they extra heavy? You know, kind of characterizing that because if they're regular, I think that regular can mean a lot of things to different people too. So some people will say, well, I have regular cycles and they're every 19 days. I'm like, okay, but that's too frequent, you know, to Dr. Chapel's point, or I have regular cycles and they're every two months and that's too far apart. So, you know, regular cycles between every 21 to 35 days is considered, you know, normal. Um, and you can find additional information about that on ACOG's website as well. That was one of the resources Dr. Chapel mentioned, but um, you know, the vast majority of the time, if you are having regular cycles, then you're ovulating. You can do um, a simple blood test in the second half of your menstrual cycle to have that confirmed. Um, if you don't want to torture yourself with the ovulation predictor kits and the basal body temperature, which again, are just screening, they aren't really confirmatory of ovulation either. Um, but to know just because you're having regular menstrual cycles doesn't mean there can't be something else going on. Um, and it's still, you know, if you kind of hit that time frame six months to a year, going in and getting additional evaluation that's needed. And just to add to that, the, you can have regular periods and still have other things going on in terms of painful periods that could be a sign of endometriosis, adenomyosis, you could have fibroids and not know that. Um, so it's definitely still very important to make sure that things are okay. Wonderful. Great. Um, well, if anyone else has any other questions, feel free to submit them. Um, otherwise, I'm going to pivot to um, some of the top takeaways. So we've talked a little bit about some of the, the questions and high level topics, but for the, the panelists, I would be curious, you know, what would be your one to two top takeaways for the group today, especially if they're just starting to plan as a lot of our, our uh, attendees today are, what are the things that you'd want them to keep in mind as they start down the path? 
Uh, we'll start with um, Dr. Eskew, and then we'll move uh, move from there. Yeah, so I think one of the most important things is, you know, I think that social media has created a lot of community in a really good way. Um, but again, just kind of being wary of, of where you're getting your information from and kind of the comparison trap. I think it's really easy to fall into, well, well, they did this, so it must work for me, or, or they said this was the thing that they swore by, so it's going to be the same story for me. Um, and, and every individual is very unique and different, um, and there's no one-size-fits-all approach for fertility care for anybody. And I think keeping that in mind and knowing like your journey is your journey and it's unique and um, being mindful of that is, is incredibly important. That's great. Uh, Dr. Stevenson, do you want to go next? Sure. Um, so for those who, who do, you know, travel down the journey and, and do encounter problems and ultimately have to, you know, seek out the um, uh, care through reproductive endocrinology, I would say, you know, build your social network, make sure that you, um, you know, have people that you trust that you can talk to. Um, it's stressful, it's complicated, and, uh, and having that, that trustworthy social network will be really, really important. And whether it's a sister, a, a friend, somebody who, who you can talk to, um, but also finding peer support, uh, finding other people who are going through it as well can be extremely uh, helpful and less isolating. Yeah, I couldn't agree more there. Uh, Dr. Chapel. So I, I think that for me, what I what I find myself telling many folks that I just talk to casually, uh, you know, either at dinner or in the hallway or that text me somehow, I, I just I say for the most part, it's starting out kind of in, in dipping your toe in this journey or even trying for a few months find what works for you and do it as simple as possible because you know this is this is procreation but you know we're humans and you're a couple and you're trying to do something you know pretty important and, and magical so it's also somewhat recreation so don't stress you know i have some patients that have three different versions of opks and and they they're logging on two different apps and they've got this this other progesterone test that they're doing and they're and they read these six books and there's just that's information overload you need, you need to have a basic modeling and a basic understanding of your cycle and your health and, and, your, and your basic you know, wants and then go from there. So I'd say, you know, strip it down to something that's manageable for you that you can actually bite off. Don't get lost in the data. Just, just take enough, enough there to have an understanding of who you are and what you want. And then the next thing I'll say is be your own advocate because if you're not getting the answers that you need, then, then escalate your care and look for someone that, that can sit down and talk to you at your level. And even if that's like, I talked to this reproductive endocrinologist and I, and I asked them the question, I don't really necessarily jive with those answers. Ask for a second opinion and, and you know, go talk to someone else um, because we all have different personalities. We're all diff different kinds of humans. We want to be able to kind of sit down at your level, meet you where you are and just, just help you through your space. You know, our, our job is certainly to try and get as many prejudices as we can, but really our job is just to help folks through their pregnancy journey. So I, I don't, um, I, I think that you asking those questions, asking, and to, to you know, Dr. Eskew's point, who, who am I talking to? What, you're a doctor. What are you a doctor of? What, what's your credentials? Where is this information coming from? And what I tell patients is if I tell you anything, if I give you any statistic, you ask me where I got that from, I will show you the study. You don't want just someone to say, Oh, I got, I had a patient like you that did that once you want people. I mean, there's a reason we do all this training. We know what the thousands of women that came before you that have your story did. Here's the research behind it. Here's why our recommendations. We think they work based on this research. So, so you step up to the plate, say, this is what I want. This is why I want it. How do I get here? And, and let us, you know, kind of guide you through that. Um, and then all the while trying not to stress too much with just data overload. That's great points. And you mentioned this term before. So um, can you define OPKs? <laughs> Sorry, ovulation predictor kits. So we're talking about, oh, regular ovulation or not regular ovulation. Even, even in someone that's having regular menses, they're only ovulating 93% of the time. So it, like, it'll drive you nuts. But um, OPKs are, are the where you pee on the stick to see if you're ovulating. Sorry. No, no. I just wanted to clarify. That's what I thought too, but I wanted to make sure. Yeah. All right, Dr. Mbay. 
Yeah, so I think my biggest thing is um, kind of a two-part thing, but first just to always remember that while that first pregnancy is obviously important, so is that second, third, fourth pregnancy, depending on what your overall family building goals are. Just always keep that in mind, especially if we know that as we age, um, success rates kind of go down a little bit. And in thinking about that, just always be proactive in getting care um, as early as you can once you see that something is not right. Um, so I forgot who had mentioned it before. If you notice that your periods are getting shorter or they're getting heavier or lighter or something is changing and you're not sure what's causing that, that's a good reason to be seen by your OBGYN, by your primary care to at least make sure that there's not some underlying issue going on that you would have done better knowing about now rather than a year or two years down the road. Wonderful. Great tips. Well, I am uh, determined to keep us on time. So I'm just going to close off with a little bit of housekeeping information, which is, uh, I didn't want to belabor this at the beginning, but um, I don't even think I introduced myself. I am Jessica Bell Vanderwall. I am the CEO of a company called Frame Fertility. We're bringing you this webinar today. And we are really in the business to help address a lot of the topics that were brought up today. So trying to help answer your questions, help you think about potential risks, potential options as early as possible. And then we complement your clinical care. So we would help bring you to one of these fantastic providers that you just heard from today. So if you're interested in learning more, we work with employers and healthcare providers to offer this product, but we're also starting to expand and work with uh, end users directly. So if you'd like to learn more, if you just have a question about what you heard today, feel free to reach out to us at hello at framefertility.com. And again, I just want to say thank you again to the panelists. It was so wonderful. I learned many new things. Um, I always learn very much from all of you. Really appreciate your time and very much excited about sharing this content more broadly with others that couldn't attend today too. So thank you all so much and uh, have a good evening. Thanks for having us. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. <laughs>